Okay, I started last week on a very simple path, set out to do something, to lay down something that hopefully will clear up a lot of the insanity that I encounter on a regular basis with people who are interpreting and studying and writing books and blogs and all kinds of things about the lost tribes, which if laid out properly will be very helpful for our study as we progress through the Bible to also understand the things that are linked to the future, to prophecy, and to the book of Revelation. This is, it's a, it's a challenge for me because I am used to uh, engaging in a different style of teaching, and it's not my nature to go back and keep laying foundations down, especially because we've got such an interesting collection of people here. <laughs> Some who have been here for a long, long time, and others who have just started listening. And that's, that can be kind of a challenge, too. Um, so last week, we started by looking at the children of Jacob. Jacob then later gets his name changed to Israel. And when I refer to the children of Israel, I'm talking about those children first who are Jacob's children, Jacob and Israel being one and the same for this conversation right here. Let's not talk about why his name was changed or how it was changed. I'm not, that's not my focus. So we began last week by looking at the children born to him. And I want you to turn to Genesis 29. And while you're turning there, so there's a frame of reference for folks that don't have this without preaching the whole Bible, but real quickly here, God called a man out of Ur of Chaldees named Abram, gave him many precious promises, but the one focus was to his seed, to give him land and seed, something of the promise in its singular nature, seed, not seeds. Abraham, with his name changed, produces Isaac, both he and his wife, both elderly, produce a child the old-fashioned way. Still miraculous, but the old-fashioned way. That child, Isaac, will produce, will marry and produce Jacob and Esau. And I touched on this last week, something called primogenitor, which was the law of the firstborn. But if you go back in your own time and read the story of Jacob and Esau, Esau sold his birthright to fill his belly. And Jacob ends up getting that birthright, conning the dad, Isaac, to get all of the blessings bestowed on him. And he produces many children from two wives, one the one he wanted, which he got duped from his uncle Laban, he wanted the real pretty one. He ended up getting the ugly one of the two sisters, and he said, okay, well, I still want the pretty one, so he had to work a little bit more to get her. And in the process of time, the ugly one starts popping out kids like there's no tomorrow, right? Let's just keep it real here, you know, no sense in trying to be uh, stained glass tones. And so we, we begin with just a synopsis of Jacob's family record, which is in Genesis 29, beginning at verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah, which is the lesser attractive, let's use that word, she's the lesser attractive of the sisters, was hated, he opened up her womb. But Rachel, the one that Jacob loved, was barren. Talk about God having a sick sense of humor. <laughs> Leah conceived and bare a son. She called his name Reuben. So that's Leah's first child, Reuben. And if, you're, if you have a Bible like mine, um, you'll see that the word for Reuben and the description for she said, surely the Lord hath looked. They are closely related. Reuben 
is related to the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Uh, the Hebrew is a play on words which we don't quite see uh, in English here. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again. I told you when I said pop it, this is a good description of popping him out because the way the chapter and verse here does it, da, 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 all right? So she conceived again, bare a son, and said, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated. He hath therefore given me this son also. She called his name Simeon. And when you look at the word heard, for example, and Simeon, they are, again, closely related in the Hebrew. Um, she conceived again. So Simeon's the second child. She conceives again. Now this time my husband will be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. And Levi means to be joined. So you've still got the play on words going. So Levi's number three out of the lesser attractive hated wife, right? She conceived again. I mean, for a wife that wasn't loved. <laughs> Just saying. She conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Again, praise and Judah play on Hebrew words, same meaning, essential, and left bearing. So that's, for right now, that's four children out of Leah. And if you continue on, you read that Rachel was in a bad state. She envied her sister because she, her womb was closed up. But just to make sure that there are children coming out of her uh, area, she gives Jacob her maid. That is, Rachel, the attractive one with the closed womb, gives her handmaid Bilhah. And so she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife. Jacob went in unto her. A busy man. And she conceives and bears a son. And so we have, out of Bilhah, we have Dan is born. Um, and then Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bear Jacob a second son, that will be Naphtali. Uh, Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister and I've prevailed, and she called his name Naph Naphtali, which is also a play on words, wrestling. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her, her maid, and gave her, you know, not to be outdone here, right? <laughs> and so Zilpah has Gad, and then has another son, if you read in verse 13, which is Asher. And, oh, here we go again. God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my husband. She called his name Issachar. Leah conceived again, bare Jacob the sixth son. And this just keeps going here. It's quite a machine. Zebulun is born, and then one daughter is born that is recorded here, and that is uh, Dinah. And verse 22 says, God remembered Rachel. Finally, right? God hearkened at her, opened her womb. She conceived, bare a son, and said, God has taken away my reproach. She called his name Joseph, because the Lord added to me another son. And you've got to go some few chapters later to read of Rachel's last and final son. She gives birth to and dies right after she gives birth to Benjamin. So there you have, um, when people refer to the children of Israel, these, this is the starting point of referring to the children of Israel, which eventually will end up going into Egypt because of a famine and moving the whole family there. And then when Joseph, the one of the sons, of course, Rachel's son, dies. This is when we begin the record of Exodus, where the people are enslaved, and Moses is raised up as a deliverer to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage. And then that begins once they are out of Egypt, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness way because of their disobedience. That's the short story. Whew. 
All right. What I want us to focus on, and I'm doing this piece by piece for a reason. It's important first and foremost to look at each of these individuals uh, and, and put flesh and blood on them and recognize that these are people, these are not caricatures, and these people will eventually be assigned territories. And when the territories are assigned, which we'll read about perhaps today and if not in the next message, we'll find that these territories, save for one particular tribe, which may actually migrate. Strangely enough, it's not really recorded that well, but they may actually migrate to a different territory. But these tribes, their territories, and then generations who live in those territories, will essentially be, I've got to go to my Bible map here to show you something. If you have one of these nifty, these things come in handy. If you have one of these uh, maps, most Bibles have a map. You'll find the territories of each one of these tribes. And they were given places, prescribed territories. Now, it just so happens, the one we were looking at last week, Reuben, um, is right here where my index finger is. I know that looks really good on radio. Um, and the two tribes that I'm at least going to mention today somewhat which is Simeon, who really doesn't have a territory. He is actually within the confines of Judah's territory. And Levi, who does not have a territory at this point, does not have any land at this point. There are cities for the Levites to go in, but no territory. Now, why is that important? Because when people talk about the tribes, at a later point, after the death of Solomon, what was one kingdom will divide into two parts. And it's important to know who was in which territory. To the north, all of the tribes that inhabited the places to the north, and all of those that inhabited the places to the south. And what will happen to these people, that when people talk about the lost tribes, we can know these people are not A, lost, B, they are not all Jews, this is, there's a lot of confusion out there. People who think, because they don't lay in adequate breadcrumb trails I'm doing today, and you may say, wow, you're really taking this down to the slowest snail pace you can take. Yep, that's right. Because I want to make sure that when I lay this down, there is nobody afterwards saying, well, what, how did this happen? And where did these people come from? I'm going to take you through a very long journey and I'm just giving you the thumbnail print of these people as I go to the best of my ability to try and show, first of all, that none of these, save perhaps Joseph, who was Rachel's child, is a type of Christ. All of these children of Jacob slash Israel had issues. That's very comforting to me to know that God would use people who are just plain messed up. And we're not just talking about an average messed up. We, we looked last week at Reuben, and Reuben went in, and it says he defiled his father's couch. Well, he basically um, had an incestuous, adulterous, very weird relation, which left him in a very bad position when the birthright blessing was being handed out as he was the firstborn. He forfeited it because of that act. And in the coming weeks, we'll talk about the birthright blessing and what it would entail and the more details. But right now, I'm trying to lay down some foundation of these people who are later on referred to as the tribes of Israel that then get referred to as the lost tribes of Israel. And if we pay careful attention, we come up with a few conclusions. These people were not, they did not have some pristine, um, you know, never, never did anything wrong. And the grace of God operating in every single instance. Now, the reason why I mention the one daughter, Dinah, is because the one daughter, Dinah, is tied in closely to events that will permanently alter Simeon and Levi's blessing from their father at the close of the book of Genesis. And it will permanently alter 
the record for Simeon, minimally, he will not obtain what technically should have been a separate portion for himself or his tribe. So I've given you all of the children born that, that are called the children of Israel to start off with when we're referring to Israel being Jacob. Now I want to look at the events that led up to the undoing of Simeon and Levi. And that is uh, in your Bible, chapter 34, the book of Genesis. Now, I, I know I will not get to explain all the things that I wanted to explain today, but that's okay. At least I know I'm, as I said, laying down some good breadcrumbs here. Nobody teaches on this because who wants to talk about this terrible passage? There, remember, there is no law at this time. There is no Ten Commandments. But God has laid some clear things in the hearts of men, specifically these people. And the promise um, given to Jacob and being now passed on, it's important to preserve the lineage. So there are certain things that they are to abstain from, like mixing with women that are not part of the women they're allowed to mix with and so forth. There's certain things that govern, but no law yet. Genesis 34, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her, lay with her, and defiled her. Now, amongst Bible commentators, there is much division of how this passage really rightfully should be understood. In my Bible, there's a label very clear, Dinah is raped. Um, he defiled her. If you read the, I believe the book of Jubilees has Dinah being 12 years old. Um, in that day and age, that was not unheard of to have, to take a woman, but it would be to wife at 12 or 13. It was not unheard of. But regardless of how you want to define the act, Listen to the next thing. It says, his soul clave unto Dinah. It's not as though he took her and then he said, nah, I don't want you anymore. His soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, get me this damsel to wife. So an indecent thing, but perhaps being turned into a more decent thing because of what's being said. Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard of it. And the men were very grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel and laying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought to not be done. And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife. And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade therein, and get you possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes. And what you shall say unto me, I will give you. There's nothing that you can ask of me, nothing that I won't give to you. He says, whatever you ask of the dowry and gift, I will give according as you shall say unto me. But give me the damsel to wife. This one thing, no matter how much it costs, I'll pay it. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and, and Hamor, his, father's, his father deceitfully, and said, because he hath defiled Dinah their sister. And they said unto them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this we will consent unto you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hamor, and Shechem's, Shechem Hamor's son. 
And the young man deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter. So you can you imagine the excitement of not delaying to circumcise oneself. <laughs> and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore let them dwell in the land, trade therein, for the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters for us to, for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein the men can send us to, for to dwell with us to be one people, if every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. And unto Hamar and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of the city, and every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. So they all were circumcised. It came to pass, well, I was going to do something with that. <laughs> I think I need to leave that one alone. Uh, it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that, that two of the sons, <laughs> that, that should be a mild understatement, right? But two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword, came upon the city boldly, and slew all the males. Killed them all. And they slew Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. And the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. And they took their sheep, oxen, asses, and that which was in the city, and that which was in the field, and all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives took they captive and spoiled, even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have, troubled, you have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I, being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me. And I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, should he deal with our sister? as with a harlot. Now, the story kind of ends there immediately. And it seems strange. And I kind of had to discuss this with myself and a couple of people to kind of get a real sense. Because you can take this any way you want, but there's one thing that really happened. The religious, even though there's no law at this time, religious hypocrisy, do as we do, knowing full well in their hearts they were going to do what they did. Now, let me just take a sidebar for a minute because there's an important lesson here which oftentimes, this happens all the time. People are not savvy enough and they'll succumb. You go into a church where you meet people who are, here it comes, religious. And they say, in order for you to fit in, we expect you to do the following. Now, I don't suppose there are too many here, but I know that there's a few who previously went to churches where you were told if you didn't dress a certain way, or if you spoke a certain way, or if you smoked, or if you had certain habits, or if you had a certain lifestyle, or if you were living together with somebody, if you weren't married. Did I name enough things here that they would not have anything to do with you because you could not be part of their select few that have qualified for perfection. You know, when Jesus came to town, they asked him, you know, does this man not know who he's sitting with? He's sitting with harlot, har harlots and publicans. He's sitting with all the, if he knew what manner of people these were, he would never sit with them. Of course, those are the people that he knew he could sit with, and they would want to know. They were open to know. So there's a little, just a little footnote before I move too quickly away from this, which is it's, it, it should be a cautionary thing for any person listening to me. Where somebody might say, you know, if you are really saved, and they'll fill in the blanks. I've done this before, but I'm telling you how many people I meet just this last week or two weeks ago, somebody made a comment to me about Christians, you know, well, Christians don't drink wine. And my retort was, 
wow, this person has no clue. The first thing that Jesus did was turn the water to wine to keep the party going. If he was so anti-wine, believe me, he would have said, no, 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 grape juice for all of you, okay? <laughs> now, I'm not saying, there are certain people, by the way, who cannot drink. They shouldn't drink. They don't know how to control themselves. The Bible says everything is lawful, everything in moderation. And every drunk knows the passage that says a little wine for the stomach's sake. But I had somebody try to tell me that this is, you know, Christians don't drink. Says who? Says your traditions, perhaps. Now, we're not talking about sitting down and polishing off, a, you know, 10, 10 bottles or a case or whatever you're, you're doing, but there's, there's nothing against that. In fact, Jesus speaks more about judging. Judge not that you shall, you know, Matthew 7 speaks that word very clearly. If you have some issue with me, I suggest before you start picking at the issues of me, go home and pick your issues out of yourself because believe me, you have them. But that goes both ways. That goes both ways. I've told you I'm nobody's judge. In, uh, since 2005, since I've stood in front of you, have you ever heard me preach a message against or for homosexuality? No, have you ever heard me preach a message on for or against abortion? No, have you ever heard me condemn somebody because they are a drug user and they are stuck in their habit? Have you ever heard me condemn someone? And these are the easiest, we'll call them the, the, the simplest things to identify, but to me the harder things to identify are the things that are hidden in the mind that you can walk around and cloak that nobody would ever guess in a million years is trapped within the closet of what we call your cranium. And everybody has that. So don't let anybody tell you somehow you need to be more religious and you need to be more spiritual and you need to act a different way. My Bible tells me something so abundantly clear. I get so sick of people telling me how this, well, you know, this is, this is the way it needs to be done. No, 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 wait a minute. The way it needs to be done is you're born from above. That's John 3. And God's life comes in and begins to live in you for a simple act of faith, of faithing, not just faithing in faith, but faithing in the living, risen Savior who died and rose up for this very thing to give you and I life and life more abundantly. And I don't read anywhere in this book that when he encountered people that were, quote unquote, of base and lesser degrees in society that he said, thou ought to, and thou must, and thou wills. No, rather, the woman at the well, he said, everything that she ever did, she ran away saying, this man has told me everything I ever did. And then some, by the way, because she hadn't yet disclosed that the man that she was with wasn't her husband. He was the one that said it. And he didn't call her anything. She's referred to as a Samaritan woman. Just keep that fresh in your mind. And by the way, I could keep going with the examples. Don't ever get trapped in a place where somebody feels that they are spiritually superior to you and can come and beat you over the head with their version of Christianity and their brand if you do not fit in it, like it, absorb it, and accept it, you are anathema. You are rejected. Well, I reject those people because my Bible tells me whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And that doesn't mean free, as Paul says, so are we free? If, if grace abounds, are we just free to go out and sin all the more? No, God forbid, but understand what the grace of God looks like in Jesus Christ and that each and every single person is broken in the eyes of God. And you see some people and they have, they, they've got a great career, they've got a great family, they have a home, they have what everything on the outside looks normal and perfect. But do not deceive yourself. There's nobody that has the perfection in the mind that the thoughts aren't constantly contaminated with things, which is why we are to stay in the Word and wash our minds and renew our minds with the Word of God. And I don't stand here ever. I never have. And I pray to God that if somebody ever says, I've said something to condemn somebody, 
The only people that I want to condemn are those pharisaical religious people or the ones who are so blatantly ignorant about what a Christian is. Ask anybody what a Christian is, and they'll tell you, well, a Christian is this, and they do this, and they do that. Christian only means one thing, follower of Christ, little Christ, follower of Christ. And if you're following Christ, you're following according to this book he used, by the way, there was no New Testament in his day. He used the Old Testament. That was his source book out of the mouth of God himself. So just take a little page out of this. These people said, if you'll do this and if you'll do that, but they knew in their hearts they wouldn't make good. And I've met people who will say, well, if you'll just do this and if you'll do that, but in their heart they don't do it either. There are how many fallen famous fallen evangelists who stood and told people about their holy and perfect and righteous life. And behind the scenes, Lord only knows the debauchery of what was going on. I've told you I'm definitely no Mother Teresa. I talk to you. The way you hear me here is the way when I'm having conversation with somebody. That's why if I crack jokes, I'm sorry, I'm not going to stop being myself. It's not that I want to make a mockery of something. There's a time to put something in your brain that I guarantee you, most of the time when I make these comments, you won't forget. It'll remind you of the story, in fact. It'll remind you of the Bible. But to just be who you were intended to be, and God basically, when he puts his life on you, he makes you more of what he intended you to be, not the cookie cutter and the do as I do, but you know, we, won't, we won't actually do that. So I'm just a little page out of this to tell you, caution to those people who are relatively new who think somehow, you know, well, I went to a church where they, they had five altar calls in, in one hour. Well, that's good for them. I went to a church where everybody gets down on their knees and prays. That's good for them. Now, all of that is their traditions and their routines and their ceremonies. I'm only interested in one thing, which is you being freed by the word of God and not bound by somebody saying, you do this. And they have no intention, by the way, of doing it themselves. They just want you to do it. This is what Paul railed against in the book of Galatians. Those people who came called him Judaizers. So a little caution there. Let's get, get back to where we were. So here we have, they kill everybody, the two sons, Simeon and Levi. They kill everybody. They take Dinah out of the house. They take the sheep, all of the possession, wealth, the women, everything. And the, the last question asked after Jacob says, you made me to be a stink on the land among the inhabitants, and we're just a few, and there's so many here. You're going to get me killed. You might think that that's a very cold reply from Jacob, but indeed, if you probe this really carefully, it's what I just described. I don't think there would have been an issue, by the way, had the men made good and had other things happened, but they didn't even have a right to make that agreement without the father's permission. And it was the father that could have said, I grant this right. Only he had the right to do that. So there's a, there's a sin against Jacob, believe it or not, that's there that we just could read right over as well. Now, when Jacob is laying on his deathbed, who then is already by then called Israel, is laying on his deathbed, and he's going to bless all the sons. That's in Genesis 49. And these blessings are important. Because as we progress in this study, we will find certain identifying uh, types for each of these tribes. But what's interesting here, the firstborn, Reuben, Genesis 49, beginning at verse 3, Reuben is addressed as the firstborn, but as I said, he misses a blessing here. He doesn't get the blessing that he should have got, which is the blessing of the firstborn, the birthright blessing. He doesn't get it. It's going to be passed on to somebody else. But it's not going to be passed on, by the way, to Simeon or Levi either, second and third. But beginning there at verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, under their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was, was cruel. 
And here's the most important line of this right here. It's not a blessing. This is not a blessing. I will divide them in Jacob. I will scatter them in Israel. Now, if you were reading on to the eighth verse, that starts the, the next son being blessed, Judah. So we're not going there. What I want you to know is that seventh verse, I will divide them in Jacob, I will scatter them in Israel, becomes really important because later, now I'm, I'm going to jump through some history. Remember, at this point right now, all of the family of Jacob and all of his sons have come into Egypt where Joseph is, who is basically meeting out the food during the famine. He's only second in line, the most powerful man in Egypt, second to Pharaoh. And when, when Joseph dies, Exodus opens with, and there was a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and the bondage of the people, the children of Israel, begins. And while they are in Egypt, they are having children, and they are producing children. Now, what's interesting is that you've got to follow the, the pattern here, because this is going to bifurcate, and I've got to try and keep this as simple as possible. There is no blessing here for, really, for Simeon or Levi, except divided in Jacob, scattered in Israel. You follow the tribe of Levi, which technically will kind of be a tribe and not, and I say that cautiously. And if you read into the book of Exodus, you find that Moses was, his family was of the Levite group of, of that family. And this produces Moses and Aaron, who, as Moses becomes the leader to lead them out of the land and begins to establish the principles of God in the wilderness and begins to establish certain patterns, this is where I want you to really focus for just a second. You will find that although Levi doesn't have a blessing here, the favor that will be given to Levi from the time of Moses, who is indeed of a, born of a Levite, from the tribe of Levi, the favor that will be given to those that become part of those men who are dedicated to serve the Lord and will not have a portion of land. They will have various cities throughout the different territories, but they will not have a portion of land given to them. And I'll explain perhaps on festival because I'm going to run out of time. Simeon, on the other hand, Simeon's lot is very strange. There's no blessing here. And just before Moses dies, Moses, by the way, committed a little faux pas as well, and it looks like on the surface, although we know better because of what happens later and into the New Testament, but on the surface it looks like he won't be allowed to enter the Promised Land, but he's allowed to go up to Mount Nebo and at least look at the land because Holy Toledo, he led the people out. They wandered for 40 years. He put up with the people murmuring. God said, okay, I'll let you at least look on the land. Before he dies, he essentially does a very similar thing to what Jacob does here in Genesis 49. He blesses all of the tribes of the children of Israel. Simeon is missing. Now, there's been a lot of debate as to why Simeon is missing. Is it a random scribal error, or is it due to the fact of something that happened recorded in the book of Numbers? Remember, I'm trying to give you some breadcrumbs that when we finally give a little bit of history, over the course of time, you're going to be able to look back and trace some of these people and see ultimately where they settled. My footnote about Simeon is Simeon is given a territory. Let me go back to my map for those of you who don't have one. Simeon is given a territory that is within Judah. He's the only one that is not given a specific territory for himself, but his territory falls within Judah. And if you read carefully, you're going to find that some of the people from Simeon, by the time you get into 2 Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, there are records of people migrating and moving around, and Simeon and some of his band are actually reportedly living in the north. 
And there's probably a reason of how and when and what happened there. And I'll tell you what I think. Sometimes I, I'll tell you I have a speculation. I have a speculation based on the event that occurred in the book of Numbers. So go with me there, and then I'll try and wrap this thing up. Book of Numbers, chapter 25. Now, while you're turning there, let me just make a, an observation. There will be a census taken by Moses of all the men. And Simeon, in the first sense, census, his tribe will number 59,300. There'll be a second census taken later in the book of Numbers. And there'll be only 22,200 men of Simeon. Don't think it's a mistake. This, it will at least explain in part where some of the men went. Some. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. They called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people, hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of his men that were joined unto ba Baal Peor. You now, people say, oh, there's so much violence here. Well, that's true. And God said, do it. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, right in his face, in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, or Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. He went after the men of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Killed them both. Never tell me the Bible's boring. <laughs> yeah, it's just another day at the office, right? So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 24,000. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it in his seed after him, and the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. So undoubtedly, you've got a portion of the men of the tribe of Simeon who participated, who partook, not just the one that got the javelin, uh, you know, joined together on earth as in heaven. Uh, <laughs> not just that couple right there, but anyone else who partook. So there's a good, very good chance that we can account for some of the tribe of Simeon being wiped out here. And undoubtedly, um, with the type of personality that these had, we undoubtedly can trace a migration of this band of people and some of the people actually exiting or departing from the children of Israel. And I can back that up with some other materials, which I will, in, I will do on festival. But that would explain why later on we will encounter some of the, some of the people of Simeon actually settled in the north and not in the south. And for you who know your Bible, you remember the the event that took place of the, the one who was wearing the garment, who got the garment torn in pieces and gave 10 
and two for the south. Well, where's the third one? That's like where the, uh, you want me to do that again? You want me to do that again? Yeah. Tore the garment in 12, right? 12 pieces, gave 10 to the north, and two were intended for the south, but if Simeon's living in the quarter of Judah and Benjamin, there should have been a third part. That's why I said, where'd the other dollar go? <laughs> if, you if you haven't been around any time much, it's okay. That never worked. No one could ever calculate where the other thing was, so don't worry about it. My point is that there is an awful amount of evidence when we begin to look at this tribe. Uh, part of it wiped out in this episode, perhaps. Some of them actually migrating north. And the book of Maccabees actually has a record of some of these migrating to Greece, if you read that record and you want to take part in that record as well. Now, why do I want to point all this out? Because I could have spent time talking about Levi, and there's such a vast, big history about Levi and the priests of Levi, which will become extremely important. I maybe should dedicate some more time to this, but I just don't have it today to explain that although Simeon seems to have missed out. And as I said in Deuteronomy 33, where Moses is blessing all of the different tribes, Simeon is not even mentioned. And yet, I go back to this because it's the picture that keeps telling me that God has a great plan, that it doesn't mean just you just keep, you just keep intentionally doing something and God will just wink at and say, it's, it's okay. But as I look at the land that will then be given out at the end of time here, which is, we have a record of it both in Ezekiel, and I'll reference something else as well, if I have time. Simeon is not completely left out. The fact of the matter is we just have to trace Simeon and find that if, if one is diligent enough to see God has dealt with these people accordingly, and yet, again, I come back to the message of grace. Here's Reuben, firstborn. He blows it. He's not wiped out. He's given territory. He's given a land allotment in the final chapters of Ezekiel, and also those who will be the preachers of righteousness, 12,000 in the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter. Here we have Simeon and Levi. We're not even talking about right now, although the strange thing is, by the way, Levi didn't have territory. They had cities. And in the book of Revelation, there'll still be 12,000 out of the tribe of Levi, which speaks again to something that says God has a plan. Why should all this matter to you? Why, what, why am I bothering to do this? Because without laying all this information out, you hear about these people and you can't understand they had to fight for their land when they went in to team up together and say, we'll go in and we'll fight the enemy and we'll kick the enemy out of that territory. And then they go into another part. Well, these two will team up together and they'll kick the enemy out of their land. But that does not last very long. And at a certain time in history, the record is very clear. Secular history records with the Assyrians moving the northern kingdom away. And this is why it's important to know who's living where. When people talk about the lost tribes and people being carried away, I told you I saw a program on TV and it just drove me insane that they homogenized the events of the Assyrians and the Babylonians and got everybody in, in this just homogenized. The Assyrians in 722 carried away, moved, deported some of the northern kingdom, if not most of the northern kingdom, but they weren't serving in the same way as those who were carried away by the Babylonians in 586, or forgive the date if it's not exactly accurate, because we know from books like Tobit and other records that these people were being moved around, they engaged in free enterprise, they traded. They were not slaves, and they began to migrate and move. And we have a clear record of some people disappearing from this territory and reappearing somewhere else. And this is part of discovering who these people are. And when you start to look at the evidence, you find out 
They're not only not lost, as I said, they are not all Jews. The people who were referred to as Jews were from the southern kingdom, those people living in Judah and the small tribe perhaps attached to it possibly, and that, that's going to be a question mark for later, of Benjamin. And then there remains the question of Simeon, who was embedded in that southern portion, but we know migrated, there were some living in the north. So when we begin, begin to see these people move and disappear, somebody said to me, how, how could you prove all this? How, how could you, and I was just reading an article about uh, a discovery that was made regarding uh, peoples that were from the Dakotas, I think it was in North Dakota, and a French uh, fur trader, I think he was. We certainly, in the early history of Canada uh, and the Americas, by the name of de Laver André, who discovered a people, an Indian people, who actually are white Indian people, and not Indian people as we know them, who had a language and inscriptions that when he brought this inscription to the priest to look at, they called it Tartarish, but in fact it could have been runic, and then they decipher that this, this piece of evidence actually has a Semitic influence to it, and these people call themselves people, there's an Indian name for them. I'll teach on this at some point, but these are people who are wanderers or discoverers of the sea. Some of them are wanderers of the land. And these people, in their far going back distance, have a name attached to them, which if you just take the English name Mandan, has the name Dan. But if you, if you read their histories, they attach themselves to a people whose name strangely refers or sounds like the tribe of Naphtali. And you begin to wonder, how did people inhabit the earth? How have people been scattered on the face of the planet? So I'm telling you, there's a reason for establishing all of this foundation. It's to start with a good foundation to establish these people were not saints. They are not part of some um, make-believe. I've heard people say they're all precious stories for, so we can learn, but they're not really real. No, these were real people. All you've got to do is go to some of the hard, I don't, I don't do this, friends. I don't look for some hard evidence and then say, well, then that validates the Bible. I have faith in this word and all of the archaeological things that come after, that's just, that's gravy for me. That's like, hey, that's great, but I don't need that to believe and to faith and to trust this word. But I can go to things that are factually in existence today, most of them in the British Library, some of them newer discoveries that have not yet been completely studied to know that many of the people being referenced in this book actually lived, historical personages, both these, the children of Israel, and some of these Assyrian and Babylonian rulers. So I don't need to have somebody tell me, you actually believe this is real? These are based on factual events given to us to make sure we read and study, to understand that we are a part of something. And people say, why should we care about this? tied into some very strong prophecy. For if a person examines all of these tribes, looks at the nature of all these people, looks at some of their blessings and the things that are described about them. I mean, imagine Issachar being called a donkey stuck between two burdens, and don't try and figure out what that might mean. <laughs> My point is that at some point you're going to look at the tribes as they were set up, as they move through the wilderness. There's no error, by the way, that if you set up all these tribes and you examine everything, even the way they were set up in Moses' day from the tribe of Judah being to the east, and if you know your prophecy, it is through the eastern gate that Christ will come. There's no error when we begin to understand how all these things fit together like puzzle pieces that as we assemble them, we lay a foundation, it actually weaves the whole book together, and you cannot travel through this book without the proper foundation and all the pieces fitting together. So I've just given you only a little snippet of Simeon, 
And the, the thing that I want to say about Simeon, I really didn't get into Levi. The thing I want to say about Simeon is this. Simeon and Levi, but Simeon specifically thought they were doing, he was doing was right in his own eyes. We see from the history of his whole tribe uh, what seems to be a certain blot on the tribe, and yet God will raise up even out of these who will be sown. What, what did it say back there in 49, Genesis 49, 7? Scattered. Then you begin to read about what certain things are said by the prophet Hosea, Jezreel, scattered. And you begin to realize that God has still been scattering. And none of these things that we're talking about in terms of promises that people said, well, they were given to Abraham and they must be to the Jews and it hasn't been fulfilled, so God's a liar. No, they weren't given to the Jews. And anybody who preaches simply that does not understand the distinction between the house of Israel and the house of Judah, two separate houses that in the future, as Ezekiel 37 talks about, will be united like those two sticks. But until that time, in the Bible, in the references, be clear and distinct about what we're looking at and make sure that you remember one thing. The grace of God through everything that I do here, that no matter what has happened, God saved a remnant. No matter what has happened, God preserved a people. No matter what has happened, he preserved a tribe. You remember I taught a few weeks ago how the tribe of Benjamin was almost wiped out, yet God preserved and made sure that the tribe continued. So what does that say about God's word and God's way? And what does that say about you and the way you order your life and the way you trust God? He'll see you through. If he's seen these band of some of them as crooked as you can get, and made good on his promises, and the grace still operating, how much more to us who know the full picture and know the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to hear the rest of this, you've got to come back next week. That's my message. <laughs> You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.